You are listening to another episode of Australia's premier wine podcast, The Vincast. You can find the podcast on my website, intrepidwino.com, uh, where you can download and listen uh, whenever you want and as many times as you want. But the best way to listen to the podcast is by subscribing. You can do that on iTunes, Player FM, Stitcher, any number of different podcast hosting apps and programs. Because subscribing means that as soon as a new episode becomes available, you'll be able to download and listen to it at your leisure. It's also a great way for you to share feedback by leaving a rating and review and letting other potential listeners and potential guests know how much you enjoy the podcast and how much you might be able to learn. So thank you very much, guys, for listening, and uh, I hope you enjoy this week's episode. On episode 93 of the Vincast, I chat with Ben Haynes from Mount Lee Duran and Ben Haynes Wine. there Vincasters. Welcome to another episode of the Vincast. My name is James Scarcebrook, otherwise known as the Intrepid Wino, and my sincerest apologies for the delayed release of this week's episode. Uh, unfortunately, I had a few things going on uh, and I'm heading to Tasmania this weekend uh, to record at least uh, one, maybe two episodes of the podcast, which is going to be fantastic. Um, but um, I hope you will agree, better late than never, because uh, I have a really great guest this week, someone uh, that uh, has been recommended by a number of people, uh, Ben Haynes. Uh, ben is um, uh, an amazing winemaker and originally started in viticulture, uh, who uh, not only makes his own wine, uh, but also is the uh, head winemaker at Mount Langy Duran in the uh, the Grampians region. So uh, I hope you enjoy this episode. Stick around till the end so you can find out how to get in touch with uh, Ben and myself to let us know what you thought. But until then, I'll see you on the other side. Ben, uh, thank you for uh, making some time to be on the Vincast. Welcome uh, to the Vincast headquarters. Uh, and uh, yeah, great to have you. Thank you very much, James. Pleasure to be here in lovely Brunswick. <laughs> I um I typically start every episode of the podcast, as my listeners would know, by asking my guests if they can remember the first interaction they had with wine that um, set them on a path uh, of of wine, you know, love and appreciation and and work. I guess. Yeah, I think for me that moment in time was pretty clear. I, I was about fifteen years old, I think, at the time. And um, I grew up in a, a family of, of wine lovers. Mum and dad are big wine fans, not in the industry, but um, I remember I was coming into the time when I needed to start thinking a little bit about, um, you know, what kind of vocation I might enter into. Mm. And I didn't really have any idea. And I remember the moment, it was around New Year's Eve, and I was about 15 years old, and dad pulled out a, a Lindemann's Pyrus. Um, and I can't remember the exact vintage. It was it was a mid eighties vintage, mm. and it changed my whole understanding of of wine. It, cha- it it gave me a connection to wine that that didn't exist before. Was that one of the Langhorn Creeks or the or Coonawarra? It's or? a Coonawarra. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I remember um, the the bottle shop across the road from my parents' house. They had all these old vintages of it, and and Dad bought some. And was like, oh, that's actually pretty decent. Yeah, they're amazing wines and they, the, the real um, highlight of these wines is their ability to age. And in fact, I recently bought uh, some of the 2013 vintage, mm. which is um, very, very young, mm. but already showing signs that it's going to be a, a wonderful wine for many years to come. Whereabouts did you grow up? Uh, I was born in, in Adelaide. Yep. Um, my father was a paediatrician and mother a uh, music teacher and shortly after... Uh, I was born, we moved to, to Bristol in the UK, oh, and, wow. um, where my father was working for a it's few years. It's the West Country, isn't it? Yep. Yeah. And then uh, moved back to South Australia, um, and then shortly after that, a few years after that, my father got a job in Mildura, mm. um, so country Victoria, and that's, I guess that's where the real connection with the vineyards began. That was I, a, I kind a of, formative period. Yeah, well, it certainly was. I mean, we grew up, again, as I said, not from a family in the industry, but grew up 
literally surrounded by grapevines and yeah. you know, a lot of them were table grapes, but yeah. um, they were just around. They were on the way to school. They were in, in, in my life and my mum and dad always being wine people and having that environment around you, it kind of, it, it probably set it all off, yeah. Was there much of a culture at home uh, as far as food and, and, you know, sharing meals and, and having wine with food? Food and wine was always important. Um, I mean, home life is pretty relaxed. Dad would often watch the news while we're having dinner. It's mm. probably not something that I'll encourage with my, my children, but it was always very relaxed and and informal. But um, we did entertain a lot, and at those times, wine was always a feature. Mm -hmm. um, I think probably the, the real connection between food and wine came to me a little bit later right, in okay. life as I really probably started to understand how it all worked a bit more and as my palate developed. Mm. Yeah. We, uh, did you have any sort of part-time jobs when you were a teenager? Uh, I did a lot of grape picking. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, just kicking the dirt in the grapevines. But, and I did a little bit of pruning. But um, no, my first, my first real job was, was, put, was um, pulling beers in a pub. Yeah, okay. But so, I mean, it's the same a, industry. A, a tenuous connection to wine, I suppose. Yeah. Um, so um, you made the decision to, to follow, a, a, you know, vocationally a career path in the wine industry? Yeah, it was. There was a point at which um, I had to make a decision. I, I, I have a, a strong um, tendency towards music, which comes from my mother's side. Oh, okay. And I, but I didn't really. I wasn't really sure if that was a, a career option or not. I knew I loved music, but I wasn't sure if it was something I would pursue as a career. And I was tossing around ideas, and literally, it was it was my father who said, "Look, um, why don't you just give wine making a crack? You know, something that you that you know I think you'd really enjoy it." it, it it has elements of all the things that you seem to enjoy. So, had you discussed kind of that with him, or did he sort of just recognise that 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 you seem interested in, in in wine, or you know you liked sort of being out in the vineyard, that kind of thing, and he sort of suggested you do that? I think he recognised an affinity to to science, mm -hmm. but also the creative side as well. Mm. And I don't know where he pulled the idea. It might have been for selfish reasons. Perhaps he re he realised that if his son was a winemaker, he might get access <laughs> to a lot of wine, and yeah. he probably does. Uh, yeah. But um, uh, it it, it kind of seemed to um, it was funny because around that time of that suggestion, I had, had to do work experience somewhere mm. in the wine industry, mm. and I ended up doing living in Mildura. I ended up working at um, Stanley's. I okay. don't know if you've been to Stanley's, but they've got a massive the, the, the big, giant the giant, giant cask, cask yeah. out the front. And I ended up doing um, a streak plating agar for a week and uh, just I think I might have lost interest pretty quickly and I didn't get a very good report card on on my experience. I think my the recommendation from the people I worked with for, you know, the uh, affinity to the industry wasn't very high, which mm. is quite funny when you look back at it now that that it's what I'm doing yeah. and really enjoying doing yeah. it. Yeah. But you eventually said, okay, yeah, I'll give it a crack. Yeah, I mean, I don't think sitting and standing in the lab for a week um, – and you know, putting together agar plates was was a real, really a very good exposure to what wine make, wine making was all about. No, um, but um, if you talk to a lot of winemakers, they go, "Well, oh, that's the evil of wine is you know tinkering." <laughs> well, that's right, and you know that's about as scientific as wine gets. Sure. And um, you know, a, a lot of winemakers will say this, but we do often start out from a, a very scientific standpoint, and we actually spend many, many years uh, and a lot of experience trying to unlearn a lot of the things that we think are really, really important in winemaking. And for me, it's kind of tending towards the things that are intuitive mm -hmm. that are most important. So are you talking from experience as far as um, studying winemaking and a wine science, um, you know, in a tertiary, at a tertiary level? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really important. And I think a grounding in science, I certainly use it as a reference point, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's a, you know, a means of keeping – some perspective, I suppose, um, and there's certainly a lot of winemakers who don't who don't um, refer to science at all, and mm. that's that's equally fine. Mm. Um, but I, I mean, I think first comes the intuition and the creativity, and then um, science can just help with some of the decision making. I think it's about understanding, really, rather, well, it is. rather than about you know controlling or or you know you know it, it informs your choices, but it it doesn't dictate them. That's exactly right. Just because you may understand the science doesn't mean that you have to do anything about it or, yeah. or use it. Yeah. But I think it's important. Uh, oh, for me, too, it, it feeds into curiosity as well. I mean, I just like to know why and how things work. Yeah. Um, and and try and understand, even though we never will, 
yeah, we learn things new every year and every time we make a wine, we learn things. But uh, mm. I like the idea of trying to understand what I can. So you studied winemaking at university? I actually started out in uh, studying viticulture. So I okay. did a degree in viticulture, which I um, completed in uh, 1999. Okay. Showing my age. Mm. And um, worked as a viticulturist. You know people quite... can't see. This is an audio <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Well, they don't now. Uh, um, yeah, and I, I spent quite a few years working as a viticulturist. Um, and then I guess it was around the times when I started working at the interface mm. of viticulture and winemaking where you're dealing a lot with winemakers and you're working a lot with grape intake, you know, sampling. And the more time I spent with winemakers and the more time I spent in the winery, the more curious I got about the the way in which grapes could be brought to life, I right. suppose. Okay. Um, so, so very, very quickly, I very, very quickly came to the realization that winemaking wasn't viticulture, and winemaking was one, one ever evolving dynamic process, and that that um, having a, spe- a specific focus in one area wasn't wasn't necessarily the way to go. It was about understanding the whole process. I'm interested to know, as far as people who you know study viticulture and then kind of work as viticulturists are are you actually told or taught that quality solely comes from from the grapes from the work in the vineyard or are you basically told like this is what you need to do to to give the quality of fruit or the the volume of fruit that the winemaker needs to then make the wine certainly uh, in my time through wine education through my viticultural studies yeah it, there was no real um, focus whatsoever on the winemaking side of things. It was very much about this. These are the things that you need to do mm. to produce the best grapes possible. And right. there was a degree of you know the, the sustainability and um, you know some of the practicalities associated with it as well. But but without you, necessarily knowing, like thinking about the end product, it was it was basically well, I need I need to do this to supply the grapes that they then that then you know it's their job to actually do the rest i think so that's that's um i mean a lot may have changed since the, since that time i mean we're talking kind of uh the mid 90s mm. and i think we've probably grown as an industry now where we understand that um you can't look at things in that manner um mm-hmm. but i certainly there was a there was a definite point in time when i realized that uh, you know the way different winemakers brought that fruit to life mm. um was really really important. Mm. Uh, so, wh- what was your first uh, viticulture job? Uh, I was working as the grower liaison officer for Hazel Grove Wines in McLaren Vale. Oh, okay. And this is actually before Hazel Grove built their state of the art winery. It was state of state of the art at the time they built it <laughs> um, in the year two thousand. But um, they were actually making their wines at Kay's Amory. Oh, right. One of the fantastic old. Um, yeah. Producers of the of McLaren Vale, so making making the wines in this really really old, um, you know, very, must, very... <laughs> you know it must be old just by looking at those labels. Yeah, well, they're, that's they're right. really going for that that image of this is old, this is wine history in Australia. That's right, and they they do it well. I mean, and the 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 winery, or the vines are certainly very old. The winery itself too, very old concrete open fermenters, very very manual awesome. processes, lots of really old basket presses. There's a few um, wineries in McLaren Vale like that, but it's a, it was a very special place, and that was actually the first place. Not only that I uh, worked as a viticulturist, but also got heavily involved in doing vintage in the winery as well. I think mm. that's where it all began. Did you see stuff that? made you kind of question some of the things that you were taught at university? Yeah, I started seeing some of that stuff quite early, actually. Um, I think you pretty quickly shake that off that, um, you know, and things aren't always what they what, what they seem. Mm-hmm. Um, you start questioning a lot more things. And mm-hmm. I think something that comes with experience and the more vintages and the more experiences you can have with winemaking, the more the, more the things that you, you are told, um, you know, need to be certain ways are proven wrong. Mm. Um, and that just creates more questions. And that, oh, that's one of the things I love about about making wine is that you're constantly asking more questions. At this um, you know reasonably early stage in your career, you know post studies and you know sort of first job, um, were you trying to taste fairly extensively? Did you find yourself um, you know finding an affinity with certain wines, you know varieties, regions, countries, that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, it was it was pretty difficult through the university years extensively tasting because the 
the budget wasn't mm. really there to do so. Um, did extensively taste goons, um, quickly realised which ones are good goon bag and which ones are not. But um, no, I think I think really um, pretty early on, despite having said the Pyrus was was my probably my first informing um, wine. I think I, I very very quickly drew to Shiraz. Yeah, uh, and and that's true today. Still, I, I, there's something about the grape that has always captivated me. Mm -hmm. um, its ability to to um, be so transparent mm -hmm. to where it's from. It's such a window into where it's from, and um, it's such a canvas as well. Mm. It's, um, yeah, it's it's a wonderful grape. Mm -hmm. So, how did you start to kind of gain more experience as far as the winemaking as well as the viticulture? It started with more, just more time in wineries, really. So it, it literally started with dragging hoses, doing vintage, doing vintage after vintage. Cellarat, yep. Yep, yep. Um, Cellarat, uh, and you know, just throwing yourself into it and just enjoying that for what it is. You mm -hmm. know, it's a nice period of time because it's it's a time where you're not necessarily trying to, um, you know, elevate your career necessarily. In a short period of time, you're really there just to gather as much experience as you possibly can, mm -hmm. enjoy mm -hmm. that experience, actually enjoy making wine, mm -hmm. physically doing it. Um, and I did that in various places mm -hmm. and um, for quite a period of time. And then I got to the point where I was, I'd like to formalise this. So I went back to uni and did the, the postgraduate winemaking right, okay. degree and um, knocked that one on the head in 12 months. Yeah. Far out. <laughs> um, did you um, travel overseas at all um, up to that point? Were you getting vintage experience overseas? Yes. Yep. I um I did uh I did after various vintages around Australia. I did um do a vintage in the Napa Valley. Oh, cool. Um, and that was that was a different experience. I actually worked for quite a big producer and um perhaps didn't get what I was looking for out of that trip. Um, but I, in some ways, I think when you when you go and when you have an experience like that, um, it's it, it's valuable to learn the things that perhaps don't suit you, yeah, of course, as much as the things that do. And um, so, I guess in that regard, I did learn a lot out of that trip. Um, but uh, yeah, also more recently, I suppose, um, spent some time working in France, which was a lot more informative for me. Okay, yeah. yeah. So, um, did you have a similar experience when you were studying the winemaking? You know about like being told this is the sort of these are the steps you have to follow and and you know you did, this test gives you an indication about that and you know measurements inform your choices um i i don't really use measurements to make decisions um so much i as i said it's more of a validation i suppose so um for example uh, and it's something that's very relevant to the work that we're doing at Langy. Uh, at the moment is we're really dissecting the vineyard into an enormous amount of detail. Sure. And um, the best way to to find the best out of any given parcel of grapes is to pick on, is, is to harvest them on fuel mm. and on optimum balance and on mm -hmm. optimum uh, phenolic ripeness. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, all, thing, all things considered and as much as you can tell from the grape, mm -hmm. uh, the the most aromatic potential as well, and I think that's something that you can only really achieve by eating the grapes and chewing them and crunching them. So reasonably early on, you kind of came to trust your intuitive nature and and to just sort of find more of a relationship with with the vineyard, with what the site is kind of saying to you, rather than sort of you know, taking taking a grape, you know, or a bunch of grapes and take it into the lab or, you know, looking at through a refractometer and sort of saying, well, it's this bone, hey, you know, we should be picking it in this X, X many days. You're really just sort of going out and, and just tasting the grapes and, and sort of making a decision based on that. That's Well, that's right, yeah. Um, I mean, for me, that's that's where the, the intuitive part of it comes in. And it, mm. uh, certainly I, 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 I've I always trusted in that, whether I'm necessarily making the best or the right decisions yeah. is perhaps not for me to judge, but uh, I certainly trust in it. And, you know, the, one of the things that I, that really excites me about winemaking is, you know, the idea of, of doing, um, you know, doing something in, intuitively and, mm -hmm. and um, you know, doing whatever you can to try and um, offer your interpretation of, of the place. Yeah. So as long as you're doing those things, and I mean, at the end of the day, if it's your interpretation then it's very difficult for it to be wrong, I mm -hmm. guess. But it, I guess it's a, a subjective matter as to whether people think it's good or not.
If you are a regular listener of the Vincast, it's possible that you've heard me talk about James Halliday and the Wine Companion. James Halliday is uh, undoubtedly one of the most important people uh, in Australian wine as a wine educator and a wine writer. And he created Wine Companion to be a resource for people to find out um, about quality Australian wine. Uh, And it's evolved into an annual wine guide and also a a print and digital magazine where you can find out what's happening in the world of wine, uh, get up-to-date information about vintages, uh, tasting notes, that kind of thing. Uh, It's a great resource if you'd like to find out more about, um, you know, particularly wine wine tourism like I did when I started exploring wine regions I looked at what um, James actually suggested were the uh, the five star wineries uh, as a, a special treat for subscribers of the Vincast you can actually get a fantastic discount on any of the subscription packages at winecompanion.com.au uh, if you put in the intrepid 30 code uh, at purchase like Aaron Fry did who let me know on the Facebook page that uh, that he utilized and took advantage of the, uh, the, the subscription discount so Thanks very much, Aaron, for getting in touch. And thanks, guys, for using the special Intrepid 30 code at purchase. So where did your wine career take you post the winemaking uh, studies? Um, so straight after I finished the studies, um, I was very fortunate, actually, because a, a, a producer um, in central Victoria, Nagambi Lakes, that I'd long been a, a fan of, um, Mitchelton Wines. I'd, mm-hmm. I'd, I'd been a fan of Don Lewis's work for quite a few years. Um, some of his pioneering work that he did with the Rome varietals, with Shiraz, with, with Grenache, with Mavergia, and certainly with Marsan mm. and Roussan. Mm. Um, and I'd, I'd met him a few few times over the years and uh, it just happened that as I finished studying, an, an opportunity opened up um, as an assistant winemaker there. So I I, uh, I took that opportunity straight out of out of those winemaking studies, and um, yeah, then within twelve months, Toby Barlow, the white, the senior winemaker at the time, moved away from Mitchelton to take the senior winemaking job at St Hallett, mm. and um, I stepped up to the senior winemaking plate uh, after about twelve months, which was really a critical time mm. because it was that sink or swim kind of time. It was very exciting, and it was all happening very quickly, and I felt like that elevated me very quickly to the direction that I wanted to be going in. So what were the big sort of learning experiences in that period? Well, I think probably um, trusting trusting those instincts right, that okay. we talked about. That was certainly... Being in that position where you were essentially kind of making a lot of the decisions, that probably put you in that position. Well, that, that's exactly right. You're accountable. Yeah. So um, it's you know, when, you, when it's your own wines and you make a decision, um, you know, that's one thing. But when when you're making a decision on behalf of a board... Mm. Uh, and at that time, they were owned by Lion Nathan, so a very large company. Mm. Um, there's a lot of responsibility that goes with that. Um, in time, that becomes less of an issue for you and less with experience and confidence. That's not something that concerns you. But when it's a new thing, um, that was certainly something that I was conscious of. Mm-hmm. But I had great people. I had Don living across the road there. He wasn't working for the, for the company at the time, but he was there as a mentor and, um, yeah, good people around me to kind of help me through the, the nervous first 12 months and then once you're on your feet and you've got the confidence then um you know the rest is history well, that was going to be my next question is did you kind of um really draw on the 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 human resources uh you know people who would have been working in the vineyards or in in the cellars you know for a number of years and kind of ask them hey you know what do you think of this and and how you uh, you know you've been here over a number of vintages you know what what's your what's your thoughts on on this element yeah, definitely, and I think that's one of the great things about um, about the winemaking industry is a lot of the, you know, obviously a lot of the the wineries um, are in quite remote locations, sure. and there's people that have worked in a lot of these wineries for many many years. In some cases, it's the only jobs I've ever had, mm-hmm. and it's really really and maybe important. their parents worked there as well. Well, in a lot of cases, yeah. that is true. In fact, at Mitchelton, um, uh, Mark Clydesdale, affectionately known as Clyde. He's been there pretty much since the beginning of Mitchelton and his son, Travis Clydesdale, is now the winemaker there and they're working together, mm. which is, is quite cool. But, um, you know, one of the great things about the industry is that, you know, people have a loyalty mm-hmm. and um, it, it's great because you, you've you got that resource there to draw upon and it's important that you do that, I think. Yeah, well, that was sort of, uh, that was something that I liked um, when I was working at it, you know, even Domaine Chandon, um, you know, like in the production team, there would be, you know, fathers or mothers and, and, and kids 
both you know all working together like that was it was sort of there's kind of like a what's that thing that what, what's that thing that in um the football where like you you're more likely to get picked for the club if your father yeah, played for the club the, yeah that's right the, 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 the family rule yeah yeah that's, that's right it's, it's almost like that like it's like well if your mum or dad has a job at the winery chances are you're going to get a job there you can get a job much easier there as well <laughs> It's a great thing. I mean, that that that's a um, that's a a means by which really really precious um, history mm. and information and knowledge mm. can be passed yeah. along. And you know, without people to do that, it you know that you might find some relics in the winery, but you you won't know what their what their story is. Yeah, um, certainly found some of those at Langy, and mm. there's plenty of those at Langy. And but there again, there's people there that that can tell the stories of them. And yeah. And that gives you a whole new perspective. Um, when when did you sort of start to head towards making your own wine? Oh, uh, was that much later on? Well, it it, it actually it's always been there for me um, for a number of reasons. Uh, I've always had had the drive to to make my own wine mm -hmm. um, and have that ultimate freedom, I suppose, mm -hmm. and. I actually made a wine with my father many years ago from um, – I, I, I did a, a period of time working for Normans in um, Clarendon. Okay. And we made, uh, made a Cabernet together in 2003. Mm -hmm. That was the first time I'd ever made a wine on my own. That was a nice thing that we did at home as a family with me and my dad. Um, but even then, there was a fascination with making a wine that I thought would best reflect that Clarendon Hill vineyard. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's where it began. We didn't. Oh, we, we did make one wine the following year from um, a vineyard in Langhorn Creek mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, but then that that whole side of the equation was put was put aside while I focused on, um, I guess, developing my career. Um, but the first Ben Haynes wine was made in two thousand and nine. Right. And um, it felt a bit like picking up from where those <laughs> those early wines left off. But that that was I was very clear on what I wanted to do. With with the wine brand, the was right that wine vision? Was that after you left Mitchelton? Uh it was just before I left. Okay, yeah. So um, I left Mitchelton after vintage two thousand and ten mm -hmm. to go and work in the south of France. Um, so the wine was made and um, bottled uh, upon my return. Mm. Yeah. So where did you go to work? I spent uh, quite a bit of time um, in the Ventoux. Vaucluse department, okay. so the southern, uh, the southern Rhone, yeah. So the vineyard I worked is a, a wonderful biodynamic vineyard at 550 meters altitude, which which backed right up against the Jugondas, mm -hmm. um, and a wonderful family that run that vineyard, and uh, yeah, got became quite good friends with with the family, mm -hmm. and as a result, um, was able to make my own wine from that vineyard as well in 2010. Oh, right. So my second Ben Haynes wine actually came from that vineyard. Okay. It was an amazing experience. Yeah. yeah. And and so that, like, clearly it was just sort of a continuation of, you know, probably the experience you would have had at, at Mitchelton working with the Rhone varieties, but in a completely different, you know, I guess the, the, probably more the cultural home of those varieties. It probably would have been a really interesting experience to sort of see how they they might have interpreted them differently or maybe similarly in some cases. Yeah, well, that was certainly the draw, I think, is, you know, they were varieties that I was very, very interested in and very, very focused in and also seeing how they might go about um, interpreting their place. Um, and the other thing that's exciting for me too is that the, the vision for Ben Haynes is very much about not only offering my interpretation of, yeah. of, of, of places but also the idea of, Doing something new, mm. that's always been really, really exciting to me. It's probably been the most exciting thing about winemaking for me is that idea that of you know the experience of doing something for the first time. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly why every single vintage um, of Ben Haynes wine comes from a different site mm. uh, because there's that's where that int intuition and creativity comes into it because you really are responding to a set of circumstances that you've never been in before. So when you returned from France, what was the the next step? You expanded on Ben Hain wines, Ben Hain's wines, um, and uh, and you went and worked for another winery. Yeah. So um, when I got back from France, I um, I slipped into a uh, at the time it was kind of a seller, just a, a seller hand position at Yering Station because I really didn't want 
what I really wanted to do at that stage was very clear to me that what I wanted to do was focus on on Ben Haynes and on making those wines and mm. on growing that business. Mm -hmm. So I worked at Yering Station um, and once again, various things changed and quite quickly I was in a winemaking uh, a wine making role there and um, that I was there at Yering Station until uh, 2014, at mm. which time I took on the senior winemaking or chief winemaker role at Mount Lange. Mm -hmm. Um, what were you, uh, what were your experiences at Yering Station? It would have been a little bit different, you know, going to a cooler climate, but still very well known for its uh, Shiraz and Shiraz Viognier blend. Yeah, well, that's that's a great thing about the Yarra, and also the great thing about Yering Station um, is is the fact that you know they do Pernod and Chardonnay very very well, but there's so many other varieties that they do as well, you know equally as well. Mm. Um, so that well, I mean, what's the MVR? Yeah, there's Marsan, yeah, yeah, yeah. Marsan, Rissan, Viognier. Yeah. Um, you know, there's obviously there's the Cabernet that's um, there's some fantastic Cabernets from from the Yarra Valley and from Yering Station over the years. Mm. Great, got some great Shiraz vineyards, um, fantastic Shiraz vineyards, in fact. Mm. And uh, but then of course Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, which is something that I hadn't had a huge amount of experience with, but it certainly got its claws into me. I, I won't lie, <laughs> Pinot and Chardonnay really. Um, grew on me in that period of time that I was at at uh, Yering Station. And then you um, got the opportunity to to start at, at Mount Lange Giran. Is it, I, I, I'm, I'm always never sure. Is it Giran or Giran? Giran. Giran. We say Giran. Oh, lots of people say Giran. But, okay. uh, well, thank you for finally correcting me. I take the lead of Damien Sheehan, who, who has been there for many, many years, and he, he says Giran. Mm. A soft Therefore, G. Therefore, I say, yeah, it's a soft G. Yeah. G and uh and yeah so you were basically at one of the most important Shiraz vineyards in Australia. Yeah look I would absolutely agree with that and that look the um, the opportunity was was huge but the the main driver was having having the opportunity to work with that vineyard uh, for someone who is really you know really really driven by the idea of um place mm. and Shiraz. Mm. <laughs> it was like the perfect storm really. And um, that was that was a, a great opportunity that I'm absolutely loving. How big is the vineyard at, at, at Mount Lange now? Uh, the Lange vineyard itself is, is 80 hectares. Um, we have another vineyard on the northern side of Mount Lange Giran as well, which is roughly the same size. Mm -hmm. And it's slightly warmer just on that other side of, of Mount Lange. So it's an in interesting um, and slightly different um flavor profile mm -hmm. aroma profile and certainly phenolically it's quite different as well mm -hmm. um it's a nice compliment for the um for the Lange vineyard but uh the, the some of the uh diversity and, and quality that can be found across that mount Lange vineyard is is breathtaking mm. yeah. what have your experiences um been since you started working at mount Lange and you know what what kind of things you excited about you know um i suppose improving on and building on for the future Oh, I think some of the uh, work that Dan did, especially leading up to 2010, the the um, the stunning Lange Shiraz 100% whole bunch. Uh, for the first time, it was 100% whole bunch, and that was a that was something that was really exciting um, to explore the aromatic potential of Lange yeah. Shiraz. Um, yeah. And that's yeah, that's something that that we are exploring a lot more. One of the things that um, where I guess our vision for Lange as as it is currently and where we see taking it is really delving into detail mm -hmm. uh, about the various um, – because there's so much difference across the vineyard and not just across the vineyard but within blocks. And to give you an example, 2015, um, the old block is a 12-acre block mm. which we, um, we, we harvested 15 different harvests out of that one block. Wow. Last year. And we have since consolidated a few, but we've ended up with 10 separate parcels from different parts of that one block. Yeah. And it is incredible to see the difference Yeah, on multiple levels. You know, the difference is in the degree of rotundone or pepper, um, the differences in the type of aroma um, ranging from the blue and blacks through to the reds. And, you know, there's, there's so much variation in the um, phenolic composition and the structure of the wines. Mm hmm within such a small area. And that, that's only the tip of the iceberg. So that's something that we're really excited about. Mm. Um, I suppose on top of that, it's, um, it was pretty exciting when I first got to Lange to find Trevor Mast's old basket press tucked away up in the old winery museum and to dust that off and to get that into gear 
um, and used that for my first vintage last year was that was pretty special. Mm. Uh, and and I suppose um, you know I mean I could talk forever on Langy, but um, in two years in two thousand and fifteen and two thousand and sixteen we've had probably the two most extreme vintages you could possibly imagine as far um, as difference in, or? in far yeah as, in as far as um between you know, the two the, yeah, the harvest yeah. time frames and the way that the way in which harvest came about yeah um you know we had the luxury in 2015 of of picking things over a long period of time the kind of chips just fell in the right places it was a, a very mild gentle vintage um 16 was a very different story, as you know, very early, very compressed. Mm. Um, so we've had kind of extremes, I guess, in two years, which has been great for my, I guess, accelerating my um, education and my understanding mm. and my learning from the vineyard. Mm. One of the, the things that, you know, everyone talks about with uh, particularly the Langing Shiraz is the, the ageability, but it's not it's not the only one that comes out of um, Lange that has incredible aging potential. We were talking before we started recording about Riesling, um, you know, and I've, I've long had a, a love affair with, um, you know, with Grampians, Great Western Riesling, you know, uh, and I think uh, particularly with age that the wines look particularly good. I could, yeah, couldn't agree more. Um, you just have to look at some of the old Lange, old Lange Rieslings and some of the old bests Rieslings as well. You know, they're just stunning wines. Um, the Lange, uh, Riesling blocks a Geisenheim clone, um, so it's a clone really? that there's not a lot of around Australia, um, and uh, it, it's, it's quite old as well. It's, it was planted in the mid 70s, sure. So there's some really nice age in there, um, and again, I mean, you know, Dan started to break down as he did with old block, um, started to break down some of the areas of that Riesling block that are particularly special, and we've we've continued on with that again to an even greater extent with. Um, finding sections that have, you know, different high, higher or different types of acid mm -hmm. um, uh, impressions and different aromas, um, and that's really exciting to be able to play around and and knowing that these wines can age for, you know, well, seemingly forever. Mm -hmm. I mean, they just they just seem to get better and better. And as far as the Ben Haynes wines, um, the, the the range, I guess, the number of products you've you, you have in the available uh, has expanded a little bit. Has a little bit, uh, not so much at the Ben Haynes uh, level. It's um, still just doing the Syrah. Or, or currently, I have two Ben Haynes Reds um, as current releases because I, I'm selling my French wine. There was a very very long maturation period on that wine. It had actually had. Um, so 2010 vintage had two years in barrel and then another two years in bottle. Mm -hmm. um, so that is still a current release. But typically there's one uh, Syrah under the Ben Haynes label. There's also a, a Marsan um, and occasionally a Roussan depending on um, the season. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also have a second label called B Minor, which is um, where I've, I've been able to kind of expand a little bit more beyond uh, perhaps just the own varieties, and I've recently introduced um, a Pinot Noir mm -hmm. and a Chardonnay into mm -hmm. that range, which I just bottled today. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've also just introduced a GSM to go with the Shiraz Marsan blend mm -hmm. that I also have, and a Marsan Roussan blend. Awesome. And did I try a? Oh, and a Blanc de Blanc. Yeah. Yes. Some bubbles. Exactly. Undisgorged um, Blanc de Blanc from 2011 mm. as well. Interesting. Which takes some explanation. Um, I did a dinner in Sydney a couple of weeks ago and I asked the room to be quite honest because the, the, the Blanc de Blanc was on pour as they came into the room and it was a, it was a bunch of um, professionals, bankers and people in the, the IT sector who mm. loved wine mm. but perhaps didn't have uh, a huge level of understanding of the complexities of wine but um, it was a different wine for them It's you know with its lees floating in it and a cloudy appearance and, um, yeah, I actually asked the room to... to be quite honest and share, you know, show, show of hands of, who, of people that found the wine uncomfortable to drink and mm. about half of them did so. Oh, well. Um, which is, I actually, you know, take a lot out of that. I, you know, I firstly admire their honesty, but I think it's important to, it's important to follow your philosophies, but it's also important to challenge a little bit too, I think. Mm. And uh, of course, Mount Langy, uh, Giran is uh, a beautiful place to visit. And, uh, you know, I've, I've made the trip uh, once before and I will be making it again uh, in, in July. But um, I, I heartily agree. I heartily encourage people to actually make the trip. It, it's a little bit off the highway, um, but, uh, but it is definitely worth the trip. 
Yeah, it is. And I'm, I mean, I'm guilty of, um, over the years, um, well, well, prior to my time at Langy of driving, you know, straight past the turn off on the way to or from Adelaide. And a lot of people do, but um, a lot of people do come in as well. And there's been a lot of roadworks of late, which, which have, I guess, uh, added some complication to the accessibility. But, mm. um, I mean, the thing is, and you'd know this having been there, is when you drive off the Western Highway and you turn into the Langy property and you see that Mount Langy Giran open up with mm. the vineyards mm. at the foot of Mount Langy before you, um, it's quite moving it's quite surreal and it's, it's, a, it's a decent drive you know up up through the vineyard to um you know this the tasting room it is i mean it's a, it's a kilometer from the from the actual entrance to the driveway to the cellar door yeah um and then it's about a, a 10 kilometer drive from the western highway to lang itself but it is well and truly worth it you don't realize what's there mm. until you you turn off that highway and um very peaceful as well yeah it is it's, it's out in the middle of nowhere so it's it's a wonderful bucolic lifestyle mm. i live there now have done with my wife and my two-year-old girl we've we moved out there in um october last year and we have a change from clifton hill but we're really enjoying it it's very peaceful it's very soothing and yeah. it's a short walk to work yeah <laughs> commute's much easier <laughs> well um ben i want to thank you for uh for your time and and coming here to to uh hit the headquarters for a record um if people would like to follow you uh on social media um or website um would you like to share your various accounts and addresses yes so um the one main one of note is uh ben haynes wine so at ben haynes wine b-e-n-h-a-i-n-e-s-w-i-n-e uh that uh that will get you twitter mm-hmm. um instagram. and it's an instagram handle and as well facebook and facebook yeah yep i think so <laughs> and um and guys i guess head to the mount langy Giran yep. website you'll easily find their social media accounts and give them a follow but uh, uh make sure you get in touch with ben to, to let him know that you enjoyed his episode of the podcast thank you very much james it's been a pleasure no my pleasure no. Thank you guys for listening to another episode of the Vincast. I have been James Scarsbrook, otherwise known as the Intrepid Wino. And thank you, of course, to Ben for his time and sharing his story on the podcast. Please get in touch with him to let him know that you enjoyed it. Uh, of course, you can follow me on social media. On Instagram and Twitter, I am at Intrepid Wino. And the podcast is also on Twitter at The Vincast. On Facebook, you can go to the Intrepid Wino page, hit that like button, uh, and that, that's where I um, share all my links and lots of other fun things. Uh, and subscribing to the podcast is a great way to stay in touch as well. So go to iTunes, Stitcher, Player FM, just like I mentioned at the start of the episode. Please hit that subscribe button and leave me a five-star rating and a review. All that information, as always, is available at intrepidwino.com, uh, as well as different writings that I've done in the past. And, uh, and also, you'll be able to find my YouTube channel through there, where I post my Let's Taste videos, where hopefully I'll be sharing some videos of uh, some of the Ben Haynes and Mount Langy Giran wines. Um, I would love to hear from you, so hit me up at thevincast at gmail.com. But until next episode, bye.